Just look at her now, Molly. Isn't she the sweetest thing you ever saw? I didn't answer. Instead, I sat quietly on the doorstep, my elbows on my knees, and my shoulders hunched sulkily up to my ears. I didn't budge or speak. Before my gloomy eyes was the kitchen yard, a gray and greedy expanse with never a tree or bush to shade it except for a lilac hedge framing it on the garden side and one sickly peach tree growing at the corner of the house. Three hens and one rooster were scratching about the flat stone at the kitchen door. It suited my humor to sit in the scanty strip of shadow cast by the eaves, my feet upon the step that had soaked in the noonday sun and to be just as wretched as a five-year-old that I could make myself. The room behind me was my mother's, the master bedroom of her home. A big four-poster, hung with dimity curtains, stood in the farther corner. The dimity balance was trimmed like the curtains with ball fringe, and it hid the trundle bed that was pulled out at night for Mary Liza and me to sleep in. At the foot of the bed was my baby brother's cradle, where Mary Liza was putting her doll baby to sleep. We said doll, baby, back in those days. And then there was Annie, my rag baby, who was a beauty when she was new. Oh, she wasn't old now, but fate had been unkind to her. Twice, I'd left her outside all night. The first time was when I laid her at the foot of a particularly tall corn stalk. I told her that I would return presently, but I couldn't find her at all when I went back. I was up and out early the next morning when I finally found her. But it made my heart bleed, since a field mouse who had six acres of roasting ears of corn to choose from, but he made his supper on the brand that served as my poor Annie's brains, nibbling a hole in the exact region of the cranium. My mother plugged up the hole with raw cotton and stitched up the wound, and the dear patient was doing better than could have been expected. But then there was a thunderstorm, and Annie was on a bench outside. The rain lasted all night and I couldn't go out to get her. One immediate and obvious consequence of this adventure was that there was nothing left of Annie's features except for her eyebrows, which were laying on with indelible ink instead of watercolors. There she hung, head downward, on the front of the kitchen fire for 12 hours before she was thoroughly dry. My mama did the best she could to draw eyes, nose, and a mouth with an ink pen, but the effect was pathetic and mournful at best. While I sat in the door that evening, putting on Annie's nightgown, I overheard my Aunt Sally say to Mama, You ought to buy that child a sure enough doll, baby. It breaks my heart to see how much she plays with that poor wreck of a rag thing she's got there. My mother's reply was so low that I didn't catch it. But the tone of her voice wasn't promising. I didn't say anything to her or to anybody else. But, of course, Annie and I talked it over. I assured her that she was going to have a beautiful sister who would love her and play with her and tell her stories of the wonderful city and how happy all three of us would be together. The next day, Ma and Pa went away to Beckley, West Virginia, and they took the baby with them while Mary Liza and me were sent to Aunt Sally's house to stay until they returned. When my aunt took us back home, she told my mother, right before my face, that I'd been as good as gold. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, Mama replied while she gave me a kiss. I was afraid she was going to be troublesome. She isn't as steady as Mary Liza, you know. Oh, and by the way, I have something for both of you girls in the trunk of my car. She always spoke of us in that way, although Mary Liza was actually her niece. An orphan, she was seven years old and the most spoiled child in the county. Pretty too, with fair skin and shiny braids of golden hair and innocent blue eyes and dimpled arms and fluffy kittenish ways. While there I was, as lean as a snake and brown as a chinkapin and as wild as a hawk. Truth be told, I was used to hearing myself being compared to all three. Mary Liza could read the New Testament without stopping to spell a word. At only three years old, and she could write in a copy book by the time she was five and do math on a slate at six. By the time she was seven, she was as much company to my mother as if she had been 17. In a word, my cousin was perfect. 
while I was often called a plague. And yet, I can honestly confirm that I had never known until this black day when Aunt Sally brought me back home what it meant to be envious. Now, I wasn't exactly fond of my cousin, yet we seldom disagreed openly. She wore clean frocks and liked to stay inside and piece bed quilts and knit stockings and read aloud to my mother. Me, I never willingly spent an hour in the house when I could get outside, and I had odd ways of my own that I kept secret from Mary Eliza because I was sure she'd be shocked or laugh at them. And anyways, my parents had arrived back home late at night, and the trunk was unpacked with much ceremony the next morning. Under my mother's best new dresses that she had bought was a long pasteboard box that she opened, smiling at our expectant faces. From it, she drew the biggest, prettiest doll baby that we had ever seen in a blue silk frock with a sash to match. She even had real hair, curly and black as coal, with round black eyes and a cherry ripe mouth. I reached out both hands and a cry of rapture rushed from my heart to my lips, an inarticulate gurgle of unbridled happiness. Yet, Mama didn't see my gesture, and I hope she didn't hear the cry I let out as she laid the new doll baby in Mary Liza's arms. For me, there was a book with only a few pictures and lots of tiny words to read. Now, I'm a hoping this might coax you to learn how to read like Mary Liza. I tell you, it makes me ashamed to say that my little girl doesn't know her letters yet. Oh, and here you are. Your pa brought you a Noah's Ark. I received the book and the Ark without a word, and I marched towards the door, my heart ready to break. My mother quickly blocked my path to the door. What do you have to say about your presence, Molly? I stood, shell-shocked, my eyes on the floor, as Mama quietly took the painted Ark from my hand. When you can say thank you and stop pouting, you can have it back. I dashed from inside the house and ran down the steps to hide underneath the porch. It was high enough for me to stand upright underneath it, and the sides were screened with climbing sweetbriar. I often hid here and played Daniel in the lion's den, where I was assisted by my imaginary friends. They were the lions, and I was always the persecuted. The fury of forty wild beasts was in my heart as I pushed aside the prickly branches and I crept into my lair. The den was paved with bricks, loosely laid. I picked up a stick and I pried up one of the bricks and I scooped out dirt with my hands, digging a grave deep enough to hold the hateful book that Mama had just gave me. I thrust it in without the benefit of clergy and I pushed the earth back on it, burying it forever before I pounded a brick on top of this shallow grave. Paul found me underneath the porch at dinner time, fast asleep. He carried me back in, and he washed me and gave me clean clothes. And then he scolded me for my unladylike ways and warned me of his solemn intention to tell my mother on me the next time such a disgraceful thing happened. I didn't mind the lecture, though. Paul seemed to know me, and I knew him, and I believed to this day that he was a better parent than my mother who bore me. And that night at supper, we had lots of guests. Me and Mary Liza sat next to each other, and Mama pulled out an extra chair to the table just for Mary Liza's new doll baby, which Mary Liza frequently interrupted her eating just to caress her or to rearrange her curls or her skirts while my own mother smiled affectionately. Me, I couldn't even taste the food on my plate. I wondered dully why the sight of the doll baby and the fuss her owner made over her. It turned me sick. As soon as I could get away, I slipped down and out the side door to find my Annie. There was a sudden new bond of union between us. She had no beautiful sister, and I had no beautiful daughter. I hugged her hard, and I cried a little over her in a brief, stormy way and those tears hurt me, but they didn't ease the hot ache in my chest or the lump in my throat. At this juncture, when my misery was at its height, I heard Mary Liza from behind me, cooing and hushing her baby doll, with tones and words that she had copied faithfully from my mother's talk over my brother's cradle. Wouldn't you like to rock her for a little while? She asked. I wouldn't mind if you'd promise not to touch her. Sometimes your hands are dirty, you know. I shut my jaws savagely down on my lips, biting my tongue, not moving or looking up. Just then, I felt her standing close to me. Annie had dropped from my lap 
and laid face downward on the step. Mary Liza picked her up and brushed off the dust from her pathetic, expressionless face. Poor thing, she purred. I hope nothing will ever happen to my Rosilla like this. Isn't that a lovely name? I made it out of my head from Rosa and Zilla, two lovely girls that I read about in a book. Well, I think it's a nasty name, was my immediate response. Mary Liza recoiled with a fine horror, which stung me like a needle. Oh, Molly, what a word for a little lady to use. I looked up at her for the first time, my eyes burning in dry sockets. I think your doll is nasty, and Rosilla is a stupid name, so there. Mary Liza looked up shocked and terrified. She glanced right and left and upward nervously, just as if she was fearing the punishment of heaven would fall upon me at any moment. Then she turned to leave. She had only gone a dozen steps when she looked over her shoulder to say, in her most grown-up and judicial manner, I hope you won't make any noise tonight and wake Rosilla up. She's going to bed now. I rose and went straight to the cradle as soon as I knew Mary Liza was out of sight. A cold, deadly fury possessed and filled me, casting out all fear of consequences from my parents. I plucked Rosilla from her bed and I threw her into the air, cuffing her polished red cheeks soundly on the way. Then I stripped off her dress and knotted the ribbon sash around her smooth neck. I had never tied a knot in my life, but this one held, and so did the loop that I threw over the branch of the sickly peach sapling in the yard. There she was, naked and forlorn. Rosilla dangled a foot or more above the ground, and I went and I fetched my Paul's riding whip from the table in the house, and the last feeble check upon my fury was released as I swung over and over towards the doll. The next thing I knew, a pair of cool, white arms closed in around me and the whip together. It was my Aunt Sally's voice, half laughing, half horrified, as she cried into my ears, Molly, what's gotten into you? All at once, red mist parted and rolled away from my eyes, and I became conscious again. And in that moment, I saw that Mary Liza was jumping up and down and screaming, and that everyone else from the house was there on the spot. My father, my mother, the entire dinner company. All eyes were focused on me and what was left of Rosilla. The lash had drawn sawdust at every blow. One arm and both legs were torn off and the stuffing was scattered beneath. The crop of black curls was tangled in the topmost limb of the sapling and the blue silk gown would never fit what was left of her waist again. Rosilla was beyond the possibility of reconstruction. Thank you.